Welcome, good afternoon everyone. Um, day four of Active London. Pleasure to have you joining us for the Sport Tech Showcase session. Um, I'll like, reframe or, or set a bit of context again or remind everyone around the, the purpose and the setup for the session uh, across the next hour and a half or so. Um, be a bit of a double-sided session. So the first half, we're going to have five panelists that are going to talk around their experiences of uh, deploying, working with technology products, supporting technology products, um, kind of a, a little bit of their experience and, and, and some of the things that we need to consider around the opportunities, but also risks around adoption of, of technology are also severely or impacted due to, due to COVID and the current climate. Um, and the second part of the session is hopefully going to be the uh, audience and opportunity to hear and see three products uh, which we have the privilege uh, through Sport Tech Hub and London Sport to have worked with and supported, um, which are products that are helping people actually get physically active, uh, integrate into communities and yeah, make the most of the benefits of uh, physical activity and sport participation. A little bit of housekeeping just before we get started. So we we'll just encourage everyone uh, to please post comments by um, yeah joining the conversation. Uh, as you will see on the slide, the, that infographic or the or the icon using the the text or speech bubble type sign on the left hand side of your screen. Um, we would also like you to post some questions across across the session, which we would use to either bring to the, to the attention of the panel or as you hear in the showcases and the presentations later on um, we'll use those questions to bring the founders of those products again um, consolidate them all at, at the end of the session so please get involved put some questions and answers by utilizing the question mark tie bubble again on your left hand side um, and if at any stage you feel the the opportunity to get involved and and, and want to be on camera specifically then again do um, do let us know so without further ado, we're going to get going. Um, so I'll quickly uh, do a little bit of a context setting on the session. So just a reminder, this session is all around new ways um, of, of, of trying to help people get physically active and importantly address inequalities in participation. Um, key point that is around how do we embrace, adopt, foster technology that can help us that, can give us scale, and can give us new ways to potentially tackle some of the societal challenges that we've been trying to tackle for a long period of time. Very aware that sport tech for some might be a, a, a very new term. So really in, in plain simple sport tech is the um, integration of the coming of the sport sector and, and technology. Um, pretty self-explanatory, I suppose, when you put it like that. But in essence, sport covering a very broad term. So sport tech as an ecosystem, as an industry, um, as a community uh, can encompass technology that is helping elite athletes, performance, stadia, fan engagement. But in our take is about uh, technology that is helping people get to be more physically active, uh, utilizing the power of physical activity to engage in community sport, community participation. Um, so it's broadly around uh, fitness, wellness, public health type products. So we've got five key panelists that I'm going to do a quick intro now. So with, with the purpose of time, we just, uh, you know, you know we've got Emma Atkins, who is the director of coaching at UK Coaching, um, hiding in, in some sort of shed there, Emma, but we want, we want, <laughs> we want kind of like question to it. Um, <laughs> Suzanne Gab, which is the National Aquatic Strategy Strategic Lead at Park Leisure. Um, with again a, a great aquatics on on brand and on theme uh, aquatics type picture behind you, uh, Suzanne Emma Gillen, uh, sports development manager at London Borough Barking and Dagenham. Ali Noyes, the health and wellbeing manager yeah. for Swim England, and then last but not least, Christina McHugh, who is their co-founder and director of Mood Beam. So, bit of a suppose context setting around the landscape and what's going on out there. Um, so we research tell us that 91% of adults are were recent users of the internet. We know if we look back at the beginning of the year and coinciding with the start of the lockdown, um, health and fitness apps saw a global increase around a 60% 60, 60 jump in downloads or installs in, in late March and April. 
if we look a bit closer to home there was almost 850,000 over 850,000 downloads of the couch to 5k product public health england product um, which is a 92% uh, increase from the same period last year um, and we see in the likes of Amazon launch Amazon Halo and Apple coming in with Apple Fitness so big tech entering the fitness exercise space but in saying that there are just like the pandemic have brought in some adoption of digital products is also continuing to increase barriers to participation and inequalities in participation and with that i suppose is the uh, awareness that digital adoption uh, can also mean a potentially leaving some people behind in that adoption curve so getting into that topic i suppose i just want to get your your on balance your opinion around you know the opportunities and risks that we are currently living and i suppose what those stats or what the, that bit of context setting might my uh, my 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 might spring to mind for you i'm happy to kick that off alex um, hey Mark, please do yeah um i mean what well, obviously we we support um coaches and we're here for coaches across the uk so what we found is that you know anything that actually supports a person to connect with another human being is is a good thing so actually where we've seen sport tech being utilized really really well is where coaches have embraced it and and it's actually helping them to then have that connection you know and that's the bit that we'd always be talking about a blended approach is the use of that so that it actually powers and enables that relationship and that connection to happen so i'm just going to start it off with the positive side that that's been unbelievably accelerated during the past, um, you know, few months. And we've seen coaches really engage really, really well with what's available out there. Um, and you'll be, hear from, you'll, be, you'll be hearing from Spond later, which is one of the products that has actually really enabled that connection between human beings to happen, which has been the bit that I think we've all been lacking the most. Yeah, and if I could just add to that in terms of um, the current climate, I think um, having technology available, particularly from the water perspective and the experiences that we've had, it's actually the ability to reach out to the non-swimming world. So there's this perception that in the water, it's everybody, all you ever do is swim, but actually it's opened it up to a whole new population that would never have walked through the leisure centres. Now, we've got existing challenges now, but as we emerge from that, um, we've got a whole world of people that will now come through our doors. I think it's an interesting one. I'll jump in actually, because I do think that it, it'll only ever be an opportunity if it's accessible to everybody. And you've got to really want to use whatever technology is available to you. Um, I think from my point of view, somebody who's not traditionally from a tech background um, and actually created something that was meant to be as simple to use for a seven-year-old, I think you've got to come at it a right way. So um, I always come out with don't over tech something, you know, no matter what um, environment you want it to be deployed in, it's got to be simple to use and simple to understand and, and simple to translate to somebody else and share. And I think that's the biggest barrier a lot of time for technology is that too over thought. Um, you know, it's got to be something that's accessible from seven to nine year olds and, and not be something that you're terrified to use. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Emma Gillen, I'm gonna I'm gonna lean in on 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 sort of some of the conversations that we were having around what what's going on in in, in the borough in the council that you're operating yeah. and having to move a lot of physical delivery to to virtual so as opposed to uh, again accelerated or, or or having your hand forced by the current climate you know what what are some of the learnings some of the experiences as opposed that you can share with that and you know maybe the risks and mitigations that 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 were identified and therefore put in place yeah i mean sort of obviously sort of you know when lockdown happened there was a sort of one day we were doing sort of various sessions. I mean, the programs we run, sort of, we sort of do from cradle to grave. So you sort of, you know, physical sessions sort of for everybody. And then sort of one day they were happening and then the next day they were all stopped. So sort of looking to how are we be still being able to provide those activities 
Um, so it's been a massive learning curve. So, you know, one of the programs I run is for the over 60s. Well, actually, yes, traditionally, as, as we know, it's all, you know the, a lot of those times they're not able to get online or they haven't got the technology themselves, haven't got smartphones, would have just a phone. But so not, you know, a lot of us didn't even ha didn't have a mobile phone. They would sort of rely on um, the house phone. So, but then there was others that were totally embraced with it and had computers, had had all forms of technology. So it was, you know, getting that balance right to sort of be able to sort of still provide something and being able to get as many people as we could online. Um, so having our instructors to do online sessions. So and they're, they're still carrying on now. So a whole program of weekly sessions that people can access online. And even though they might have been specifically for sort of the older um, programs that we run or the older people in the programs we run, but actually because they're online, anybody can get into them. Um, but then, I mean, with, with the street tag that we'll talk about later with Sean, it's sort of ensuring that, you know, with that families can sort of go, go out and, and sort of do some activities together. But even but within lockdown, it was sort of looking at, well, how can we utilize that if people couldn't get out for their um, hour session because they were shielding and were staying at home? Well, actually, we could get them to do some activity in the garden or just sort of utilize some of the sessions that we had online and be, be still able to use the street tag app as well. So it's it's been difficult because even even if it's not the older people, you know, we've still got other people sort of, of all ages that might not have access to yeah, even if they might have a phone, they haven't got that much uh, data on their phone because they would they would normally come into the libraries to utilise the free Wi-Fi, but they haven't got that. So, you know, it has it, for for a lot of people it has been tricky, and that is still going on. But you know, build, thankfully buildings are beginning to open a little bit, so we can actually get people in. Now that we're in tier two, we might change it a little bit more. Who knows? Yeah, um, it, it's it's ever changing. But yeah, we're still trying to find ways that we can carry on. Um, and still being able to provide. So, so I think um, Emma, you kind of Emma Atkins, you touch on around the the benefits of just bringing people together, and obviously the the current climate has taken the ability of doing so physically, taking that out of the equation, and digital at least giving us an an ability to connect people. Emma, you kind of touch on, I suppose, some of the intricacies there around. Yeah, cert certain parts of the population are digitally disengaged, so therefore the opportunity might be around maybe the pe the, the, the supporting network around those individuals tapping into that technology and kind mm -hmm. of being able to bring that that user o o on that journey as such and you know christina you touch on there around like you know not you don't overcomplicate the technology and you know don't get maybe too carp on all the, the the sort of the the whistles around the um a, a, around the product so so i suppose is it is it a case of are we saying that the, the technology is there but maybe it's more of an awareness and education piece for for the sector that is needed or is it kind of a bit of a you know a double h approach that we've got to educate founders on how their tech's got to come into this into the into the into the sector as such and but at the same time educate frontline staff people on the ground um maximizing the opportunities that comes with it I think um, as an operator working with technology, um, we, we in the fitness world, we were quite traditional. We actually didn't have a lot of technology embedded into our leisure centers. When everything shut down, we had to shift very quickly. Otherwise, we would have lost touch with our members. And if you think from a, from a customer point of view, for us to lose touch with our members for four months is a really long time. So a lot of us became really agile in our offering and then targeted third party um, platforms to be able to start engaging people with fitness and still being able to talk to our members. And in doing so, I think there was a report that Mintel published in June 2020, which showed 53% of Brits logging on and using some form of physical activity. And of that 53, another 50% of them, that was the first engagement they've ever had with a physical um, activity. So I think or, or sorry, fitness platform in terms of digital platform. So I think if we look at that, we could definitely allude that potentially it is starting to target a different demographic of people. And I think moving forward from this point in time as our facilities are opening, leisure centers are under huge amount of pressures. They're very, very expensive. All these facilities um, are now just focusing on their core offerings, which means those traditional 
programming where they were instructor led, they may take longer to come back. So having a technology like GoodBoost um, where you're bringing a GP referral in and an individual can engage with that technology at a time that suits them in a wider session that more people can come into, all of a sudden we're opening up what actually we can offer within our facilities. Can, can I jump in um, on that one, Alex? Um, Please do. I think, I think that's a massive point actually that Suzanne's made is that um, Traditionally, it's very been uh, it's very much been sort of you know uh, laid from the front and instruction, and I think the most exciting thing that we have seen you know sort of to explain where where our where my area is is sort of health tech, is the user led approach. So it's actually allowing people to decide for themselves how they uh, tap in, and and the bigger sort of layer uh, on top of that is the user led. I think is massive. Um, change for everybody but I think the next layer on top of that is how you share that information how you do it together and I know that sort of where you know the evolution of Moodbeam if you like came from was a very personal point of view but it's always personal no matter whether you're working it within sport or you're working it within industry or education or health and social care it's almost like allowing people to decide in their own time how they want to tap into this technology and then do it all together because nobody wants to do wants to be the first. So what we've found, especially in COVID times, is that um, what you would have maybe traditionally held back on, you go forward with because everybody needs to have some sort of solution and something to look forward to. And knowing that you're in it together is a massive bonding experience. And I think that's where the barriers have broken down for a lot of our the users of our technology is that they're showing their grandma uh, and they're showing their brother or their sister or whoever it is, and a lot of the time it's on screen. Um, so actually having that conversation, that conversation might never have happened before COVID, or if it did, it was when a problem became apparent. Shouldn't have to be a problem. It's almost like starting together and doing it together sometimes stops problems happening. And that's a very simplistic point of view, and I'm not an expert within sport, but I'd like to think that I've got enough knowledge and learnings now around people and people technology and it's got to be people friendly or you just won't get the buy-in and the capacity to share that information oh, i think uh, emma am i atkins you might be on mute it's fine can you get me hear me now good good ah but that's a really good use of tech isn't it when i can <laughs> drop you hey, hey um the um i think building on christina's point back to what i was saying i mean one of the things that we we need to, I think we've been seeing during um, the kind of pandemic time is um, everyone's gone and accelerated out there with tech. And there's a load of stuff out there that people may be having actually quite bad experiences of tech for the first time uh, because it hasn't necessarily been thought through. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of kind of prototype level stuff that's just kind of flying out there very quickly, quicker than ever before, really. Um, so I think that that's one of the things that we need to be uh, conscious of as a, as a sector. Um, but I also think that there's, um, I, I was, it's actually, I think it was Ali's uh, chief exec talking about, you know, a piece of tech that actually wasn't working for her because she needed to have that person to person approach, you know. So there's, um, there, I think it just always has to in, be enabled by a conversation. And I think the best solutions that are out there has built a really strong person-centered community that starts that process off. And then the tech just enhances that, kind of going back to my earlier point. And Mood, Moodbeam that I've been involved with and utilized myself is a prime example of that. And don't always think that tech is, a, is your phone, right? Sometimes tech isn't your phone. Sometimes tech is something like you can see Christina wearing on a, on a collar. So there's like, there's a whole range of different tech uh, solutions. It, don't be, um, scared by it all having to be on a laptop or a mobile phone it doesn't uh, i'm gonna um conscious i suppose that, that our audience ali ali noise please click please come in oh it's still muted ali i think sorry apologies um yeah i uh, echo what emma said around there are some individuals that go into a particular 
um, sport, and I'm coming obviously from a swimming perspective because I'm biased, uh, but there are some people that just get in the water to get away from any sort of digital or any sort of technology. Um, and and the, you know, the effects of the mental the improvements on mental health and well, well-being around just getting in the water and being away from it all. But, but likewise, I think during, certainly from our experience as an organisation, there's some digital um, solutions that have been imposed by some of the le leisure operators because they've had to, um, but actually they're going to carry on on a permanent basis. And I'm thinking specifically about pre-booking your lane swimming as an example. So previously, someone would just rock up, get in a, a pool and realise there's like 15 people in a fast lane. Now, because you pre-book, you know how many people are in that lane, you know whether it's a busy one. So you know you've got an opportunity to actually speed up and down at, at the pace you want without being interrupted by someone else. So I think there's some huge opportunities from some of the tech that's come through as a result of COVID that will, will be there permanently. And I think one of the benefits actually that Ali is talking about and the fact that we are now having people register when they come into our facilities, it isn't just for track and trace purposes. We can start building big data. And I know that when we start talking a bit about big data, a lot of people get really nervous about what that is, especially if they've watched Social Dilemma on Netflix recently and deleted every social and media account. But, but what they don't seem to, what, what it really is and what we can do with this data is we can create a single customer view and we can start tailoring our offering to the individual customers. When Emma talked about users and, and focusing on making sure, um, and Christina, making sure that the, you, we're tailoring everything to the user, we're now going to be able to do that. So we will know that if someone is a first time in our facility as a GP referral and is working through the water, we can then start making recommendations. Actually, once they hit this point, maybe a yoga class is right for them and start diversifying the offer and starting to engage them in our, in our facilities and start building on that community feel that leisure centers should be. So it really starts to, um, it, and it will change this industry and open up doors and opportunities for other technology companies in a way that we've never seen before. It's a really exciting time, actually, to be a part of this industry and the technology moving forward. Thank you. And, and I suppose with, with that in mind, Suzanne, thinking that regardless of whether you're a, a very small grassroots club that might be in the audience right now or watching these later on or at another, at another time, or you're a you know, fairly large leisure operator, I suppose that the point that I to consider is like, if we, we shifted as a sector around talking from participants to starting talking about customers, and I suppose in order for you to know your customer, you've got to understand trends, you've got to understand how many times they're visiting, what they're visiting, what they're doing, and then trying to build a better picture or maybe what are the safety nets that can be created so they don't they don't drop off the, the participation barrier. Um, with that in mind, there was a, at, a, at another session um, much earlier today, there was talked around uh, our research um, showed that 6% of CEOs felt prepared for a, a, a pandemic, but more importantly, were prepared to sort of digitally maximize their opportunities. Just just thinking, I suppose, out loud and, and almost then, what are your takeaways from an audience point of view an audience member point of view around and again like emma emma atkins you just touched on that there's there's almost you could be overwhelmed by choice overwhelmed by solutions so what are potentially some of the takeaways for for people considering um you know a first dab at working with a startup or a or a tech product digital product that is already out there mm. I'm, I'm, go ahead <laughs> I was just I was just really, really quickly gonna say um a huge learning curve for us as a connected sort of health tech brand is the fact that when we speak to a lot of workplaces and organizations now, we have to sort of say from the get go, do you know what question you're wanting to ask your people? Do you know what sort of frustration you've historically had but never been able to evidence or, or show? And a lot of the time they turn around and go to the what and get a you know, they're asking their HR managers if it's a, a, an organization or they're asking their line managers or a practice manager if it's a set of GP practices. You know, what what is the question that your people have a burning desire to have the answer to? And I think that's where most people need to start from. They need to start sort of like um, listening and where there's been pulse surveys, engagements with, uh, you know, users or, or people, you know, did they ever get the feedback? 
PDF get an answer to the feedback. And you've got to sort of ask the right question in order to answer and find a solution for the problem that maybe you didn't even know you had. I, I was going to just add that, I mean, we've got to, you always have to start with um, why. Um, and going back to the other Emma's uh, points earlier, I think it's also making sure that you may realise that what you want that what you want that for, you might need to be doing something else to get to that point. So we do. I think one of the things with kind of all the big research stuff is that it can kind of embed a bit of bias, and sometimes so you know there's this bias out there that older generations aren't connected to tech and younger generations are. Well, actually, younger what we found with some of our apprenticeship stuff is that actually younger generations are used to having physical stuff given to them within the education environment. So actually, they don't want to be using their mobiles and using up all their data, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a whole, I think if you can make sure you absolutely engage with who your end customer is first, and then you design back from there. Um, and that's the most important thing I'd say, because I think sometimes I've definitely made assumptions on what the customer end customer is needing. <laughs> and then when you come full loop round, it isn't actually fit for purpose. And, and I think um, being being a, an operator or someone who's going to purchase into those technologies, one of the most important things you can do is analyze your own internal strategy. It has to feed into your business model. It has to feed into that strategy. And then to go on to both what Emma and Christina are saying, know exactly what you want out of this project. Involve every department before you roll out technology because your finance or the person within your company who's doing finance or marketing, whether that be someone else or whether that just be yourself, you may want things for this technology to do and it won't encompass everything. So be clear on what your objectives are and be clear on what your objectives are to the developers because they will tell you then and there if their systems can do it. And then you need to completely communicate those objectives to everybody that is at some point gonna touch this technology. So that may mean that a member of your staff who once will support an end user, they need to completely understand what is the purpose of this technology, how do you use this technology, and what it can't do. Because the one thing that you can't do, which I think we touched basis on earlier, is if the user does have a bad user experience with technology that first time, it is really difficult to change mentalities for some reason. I think because technology, we always expect it to be better. And whether that's because we go to a different model of phone each and every single time, when we sit down with this technology, we have this presumption thinking, this is gonna be the best experience of this fitness app and it may actually have limitations. And so you do need to communicate those limitations to the users so that you can stop that preemptive, well, why doesn't it do this? <laughs> and there's, there's always hidden costs. So just be aware of your hidden costs because everyone mm -hmm. just thinks that there was a lot of pressure put on a lot of organizations at the start of lockdown to just put everything out for free. And I mean, we, we did put some stuff out for free, but we paid for it because we, there was some costs behind the scenes that you had to cover. So, you know, we, we put out the mental health awareness course for 35,000 people, took that up, but every single person costs us something because they have, there's a platform to run, there's a license to run, et cetera, et cetera. So don't kind of go into things thinking that the only cost you've got is what you're paying to the, to the, um, the tech designers. It's not, it's actually a load of other stuff that's around the scenes. So just really make sure that you kind of work that one through. I think people think that digital is really cheap really you know just get it out there get it out there and that that model i think um needs to be challenged because that's not always the case never the case <laughs> mm -hmm. ali please please yeah okay. there you go you're on. Say, on top of that don't be afraid to reach out to other organizations so the ngbs um, of any particular sport that you're involved in because they'll have a wealth of experience and they're not always particularly digital they're not always they haven't got the technology experience that the, the new startups have got but the ngbs have got a wealth of experience in the sport that they're dealing with and they'll have lots of insight they'll have loads of um, behavioral change particularly from a swimming perspective that is available for anyone to use so don't be afraid to approach those individuals and and use them thank you um so 
kind of I suppose one 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 quick question uh, or last question potentially and then hopefully um as I said if you're in the audience you could uh post some questions for the panel uh to consider towards the back end of the session where we'll bring them back together um but um and Emma Gillen maybe maybe again start with you and give everyone a little bit of like you know pre-warning um as as we come round but um and this is uh, potentially a quite biased uh, question because I, I, I'm keen to understand through our work that we do at London Sport and in particular through Sport Tech Hub, which is fostering innovation, working with startups, working entrepreneurs, trying to bring them into the into the ecosystem, into the industry, into the sector. Um, what is almost a, 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 the, the, the call to action maybe from a, from a sector point of view, and, and I'm talking maybe, you know, sort of top down sector point of view around maybe the education the awareness the access the, the the things that need to be done to ensure that a community organizations are not left behind in the opportunities that technology might give us but also some of the things that you mentioned around you know what you need to be considering around understanding the problem that you're trying to solve what, why you therefore want to engage with a product maybe don't make pre you know sort of bias conceptions around certain users disengaging with that piece of technology because of the age or demographic or, or gender and so on so yeah if there was something a, a kind of a uh, from from all of you a a one thing to consider as such what, what it might be f for us or for wider bigger organizations umbrella organizations in the sector to do considering that tech is not going away and the adoption of digital products is not going away but we just don't want to look back in five years time and think actually there's some great stuff that happened, but we also left up, you know, a shell of people behind or are actually haven't really addressed the inequalities um, in participation or in access. Um, oh, that's a, that's a tricky one there. Yeah. <laughs> five years down the line, we still, we could still have, I don't think that's the thing, five years down the line, there were, I'm sure there are still going to be people that are sort of, they are sort of not still not able to sort of access things. Um, I suppose some of it is time. So obviously the 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 time that we've spent with Street Tag over sort of, sort of three years that um, we've sort of been commissioning and, and supporting them, you know, it's taken time and it's the 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 program has developed so much. So actually, you know, had we not had it during um, lockdown, it would be interesting. You know, if we were or or if it was at the beginning of the product where we were three years ago at the beginning of lockdown, we would be in a totally different position now than we are, uh, or then then than we are now. So um, it's sort of you know, it, it, I suppose it, it's finding those those technology apps and and things that actually work for the the, the population that you have, um, and as we've said earlier, sort of making it as simple as as possible um because yeah if, it, if it's difficult you know pe people aren't going to be able to access them so you know what one one click or one sort of sort of swipe here it makes it a lot easier than having to sort of go into various bits and pieces to sort of make that app work so it's, it's as simple as possible and that, that will cover across the whole of all of the ages that are working on it as well thank you thank you i'm just going to move it as you appear on my on my screen so christina one, one kind of like yeah key consideration key learning point around ma making the most of the opportunity or mitigating risks that 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 might be there yeah i think it comes back to the point they made about bias um so uh, again not uh, immersed in the sports industry but certainly with a lot of ambassadors and and colleagues in it i would say that there needs to be a lot more listening done than talking you know you need to actually um sort of take out the age barrier and the gender barrier and the ability barrier and find out what would really make them start a conversation about what would actually get them off that uh, sofa or get them on that bike or you know from my point of view i could not possibly you know do without my you know one hour of a dog walk every day because that's my mental health basically but it's also one of the most enjoyable things you could possibly do but for a lot of people maybe they can't do that so it's almost like bringing the technology to them you know if they haven't had the opportunity to voice their frustration and not being able to do something or they've always fancied doing something but yeah i can't do that you need to make the tech like in our case we like to think that um our technology is used from seven to 97 you know uh, and it's that non-verbal element of if you're almost too embarrassed to bring it up 
just sort of log it and share it, you know, and actually say, you know, I did that the other day and it made me feel really good. Well, if you do something and it makes you happier, do more of it. But how do I know what that is? So we'll go back to the question again of they've almost you've almost got to ask them what have you always thought that you couldn't do and rebuild. Suzanne, would you like to come in on that, please? Uh, yeah. So from, I guess, from my point of view, um, the most important thing you can do when you look to roll these out within your own organization, when you start working from a track, is training, training, and more training. Train absolutely everybody in the site, and then create an induction process so that when you've got new employees coming on, it isn't somebody training them. It's, it's a video about how you want this technology properly used so that you don't get a watered down usage of the system. And I guess the other point I would say is diversification in your offerings. So, and I'm not just saying in terms of, you know, the actual technology that you bring in, but if you have something that sits on an app, for an example, or you have a watch, make sure that the user can make the decision themselves, that they use their own physical technology or that they can rent or borrow a piece of that equipment off of you or even potentially an old school printed off version of it so that then you can transition them over to the technology. So you, as much as you can, diversify so that people can make their own decisions on how they want to engage with the technology as well. Thank you, Ali. And then Emma will come in. We're coming last but yeah, not least. Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll echo having worked with Ben with Good Boost. Um, I'll echo Suzanne's comments, but I think additionally, you, your tech is your product and it alters people's lives. But don't forget about the actual relationships you have with the partners that you're working on. Um, so if, if you haven't got a great relationship with who you're working with, then when you come across hurdles, you'll never be able to overcome them. So if you are starting on this journey, build a great relationship. Um, so you can be honest with each other, overcome all the issues, break down the barriers and for mutual success for everybody, including the, including the end user. Thank you very much. I've just really quickly just sum up exactly what this, everyone else has just said, these wonderful women on this uh, screen with me, is um, basically people first, people first, and then the tech support. If you don't do the bit first, tech ain't going to be a solution thank you uh emma Atkins, uh, it's always a it's always tricky when you go last it's like that that element of trying to <laughs> trying to work out whether there's a there's there, there's something different to what i have said but um i appreciate for you being a yeah a great panelist there and 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 still kind of coming in with something so that that concludes this part of the session so thank you very much to all you five for being so honest so honest, transparent, um, and yeah, kind of giving in terms of your your knowledge and expertise. Um, we're going to kind of bring you off the virtual stage for the time being, but um, we will come back. There is a few questions that have come up um, that you feel free to interrogate and, and have a look for the time being, and, and we'll bring you back again towards the end of the, the session. So once again, thank you for your time, for your input, and um, yeah, look forward to bringing you back on stage. Um, in a short while. For the next part, then we've got uh, three 10 minute uh, presentations, pitches, showcases from three different products that are um, enabling or, or, or eradicating some, some inequalities in participation in, in different ways, uh, shape or form. So we're going to be bringing shortly on the virtual sta stage um, street tag, um, who would have the first 10 minutes to demonstrate, showcase their product. After that, there will be the turn of Spawn, um, who you might have also seen is um, one of the, the Active London um, or sponsored, has been sponsoring Active London across this week. And last but not least will be Good Boost, um, which again would have 10 minutes to showcase their product and hopefully send you away as an as an audience member with some knowledge around some products that are out there and how they are right now making an impact to the to, to the sector positive impact to the sector we're operating in so without further ado the first person up will be sean who is the founder of street tag 
Street Tag is an app that is helping families, groups, individuals to be physically active and come together around physical activity by digitizing the open spaces. So Sean, over to you. Okay, thank you. First, just to check that everyone can hear me. You're good. You're good on audio. Oh, brilliant. Okay, so it's actually going to be very interesting to follow that up. Uh, that was incredible. Thanks, everyone, for uh, on that panel. And it really possibly has helped me also to really fill in the gaps of some of the things I'm going to be sharing about Street Tag. So essentially what Street Tag is, the reason why we, we built Street Tag in the first place, uh, initially originated from Barking and Dagenham, um, was to help families to become more physically active, especially those families that are not as physically active. And later on, it then became, that we got to the point whereby even if you're physically active, how can you help you to maintain that? And how do we make physical activity really fun? So it doesn't even feel like, a, uh, like you're making much effort, but even though you are. Um, so essentially how the Street Tag app works is available, is free on the App Store and the Play Store. Uh, once you've created an account, you essentially have an experience where by, there are virtual tags that appear like a button uh, and spread across on the map of your phone, home screen. So the idea is that each uh, each individual family, groups of families, you meant to walk and or, or cycle, run, or a uh, or row if, you, uh, if you're in a wheelchair to, within, to be within 40 meter radius of each virtual tag. So once you're within that 40 meter radius, you collect the points assigned to that tag. And on average, each point is around 10 points on average. And the ones that there's some that are a lot much bigger than 10 points as well. So you're probably wondering, okay, so how does this all fit in? So the, what makes it really special is the gamification that we we've built into the system and a lot of feedback that we've gotten back from the community to keep on imp improving the platform. So a few examples, one, for example, after every 18 tag that you've collected, you earn a bonus of 200 points. Now, what typically happens and what we've heard back from uh, families time and time again is, for example, if you can imagine uh, a parent doing a school run that would normally take a 10 minute route and maybe on that route, they might collect uh, 15 tags on that route. But what tends to happen, uh, what tends to happen is, um, uh, what tends to happen during that time is that families will go on a, uh, on a different route instead uh, because just so they can get the 18 tag, they can get more tags than, than they want. So what that means is, they get to go on, uh, they're doing more exercise on, their, on Saturdays between 10 and 10.50. We encourage families to tour different parks in the area. So uh, 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 and then the park changes every Saturday. So what we've been seeing is that suddenly People might just about go to one park. Now they're going to for average four parks in a uh, in a month in a community. It's really, really uh, quite interesting. And just a final bit on on what Street Tag is. So there are three key stuff that I would love to uh, to share because I think this fits in really nicely with some of the conversation around, especially during the lockdown and and how we've had to adapt and evolve the platform to be more suitable even for all all, all types. Of different people and also of people in different uh, situation in in London and as well as outside London as well. So, for example, we've done things like during the lockdown. Once we realized, I mean, on the to give you an idea of how the impact of the long lockdown on on physical activity. Very briefly, daily we had families they were doing over twenty thousand tags being collected per day, and then suddenly the lockdown came. It that dropped down dramatically to about a quarter of that. So we quickly had to figure out a way, okay, if families are not going outdoors, how do we help them to still stay active physically indoors and then eventually transition them to feel confident to be doing their an hour of exercise daily? So that meant we had to introduce our, uh, introduce our uh, what's it called, our, as being able to sync steps. So on Street Tag, you don't just sync, um, you go out there to collect tags and you can now sync your steps using Fitbit. And yesterday we just released uh, a new version that you can now sync your Apple Watch. The app also, we had to build in 
uh, inbuilt pedometer for the app in itself. And it, as you can imagine, it's quite challenging because lots of families have different smartphones. So it means we're having, we're constantly uh, updating the platform. Another interesting stuff that we recently introduced, which was actually uh, fed back to us as a result of feedback from some of the fam um, one of the local authorities that we work with, um, their HR team said mentioned to us that their staff we have become very uh, are saying to us that they've become very sedentary at home. They just sit in front of their computers uh, doing their work. So how can we get them to take breaks? So we introduced something called Power Hour, which is now uh, widely available for everyone now. Whereby if you pick an hour a day uh, in advance or up to seven days in advance. Now, if you, for example, if I say I'm going to go and exercise at 8 a.m. tomorrow morning or at 12 p.m. in the afternoon, if I go to go and exercise during that time, all the tags that I collect will be triple pointed for me. And lastly, uh, one other thing uh, interesting that, that we've introduced to, uh, to support families is something called PE codes, whereby during the lockdown, and if you tune in to watch uh, some, as you know, there was a lot of fitness video became a trend. If you turn in to watch certain fitness videos of some of our partners, basically you, you get to use their PE code that will be displayed during that session, which would then uh, credit you a bonus, a bonus point. So all this was really good for us because we're able to suddenly now have a range of being able to understand even during the lockdown how, how active our families are, uh, which is really useful insight for us. Uh, in terms of these, uh, who we're working with, so we're working with lots of local, a few local authorities. So uh, range from uh, uh, Basildon, London Broad, Barking and Dagenham, Redbridge, uh, Kingston, um, Hounslow, and we've just gone like across Oxfordshire now as well, and as well as Cherwell, and a few other places that we're looking to go live in. And we've also been doing some work with some arts organizations, schools. I think to, right now we have like nearly 100 schools uh, that, have not, that are not using street tag, so as part of their actual travel to school. Um, leisure centers, NGOs, local businesses, and then we also work with workplaces as well. Um, I'll, I also think it might also be useful to touch on some of the impacts and the value that we've been able to extract out of street tag. Um, so right now we have a, a quite a few thousands people, active families using the platform. And out of that, uh, even actually interesting enough, we only introduced the steps tra uh, steps tracking during the, uh, during the lockdown. I think like a month into the lockdown, and right now, today, as of now, as of yesterday, there's been over two hundred thirty eight million uh, steps that have been done, which is nearly a quarter of a billion just within the past few months alone. Uh, that's happened on the, on the app. Um, and we know that also since we launched about well, back in January 2018, there's been over a million miles that have been achieved by families on the platform. And we have older people that have used and are still using Street Tag as part of their health recovery prescription with their GP. We have users ranging from four years old to older people in their 50s and 60s that have even won the leaderboard four times in a row, uh, whereby they actually have been, uh, they've been they've beaten a much younger age group teams on the street tag um, platform. Um, I guess also to kind of really make, uh, bring all of these home, I invite anyone to, you know, please go on our website uh, and there's a podcast section on the website where you can actually listen to, like I think we've done about 18 podcasts where we interview some of the users of, of street tag today. And then we have a few more scheduled interviews that we're also doing as well. Um, in terms of who we're looking to work with, obviously we're looking to work with more local authorities, art organizations, schools, local businesses as well. So I'm actually, right now, I'm in Oxfordshire um, because as far as going live here, we're working, we're doing some work with some in, in Vail. Uh, we're doing some work whereby we actually add in a QR uh, tag uh, onto a lot of the, uh, some of the sculptures, about 50 of them in Veil vale of Whites here, one of the districts whereby we are also encouraging families to go and visit some of this artwork uh, around the community. Obviously, at the same time, they're also exercising as part of that process. Um, I think I only have about a minute left, so I'll probably wrap you up at this point, and hopefully uh, they, I'll get some Q&A later on. Thank you. Thank you. Over to you, Alex.
We will now swiftly move on to Spawn. So Spawn is a award-winning product that is helping millions of volunteers, uh, group leaders and coaches take all the admin uh, and pain points of organizing grassroots sport and physical activity um, by utilizing their, their, their app. So Trinari invite you onto the stage and then you got 10 minutes to talk us through a product. Can you guys hear me? We could hear you now. Okay, perfect. So, hi guys. Thank you so much um, for uh, letting me be here today and thank you. Well, uh, so I'm just here to talk you through a little bit about Spawn. So move next, please. We exist to give you more time for what you love. So Spawn is a free and inclusive and easy to use app um, that exists to serve teams and groups of all kinds. We're activity agnostic. So we sort serve, you know, all sorts of sports and activity. And we also typically would serve, um, you know, groups and teams and activities sitting outside of sports. Like if you were, if your kid did choir or a marching band, or you were part of an, a you know, political party, that is also something that we do support. So our mission is to digitize organized activity, uh, essentially removing all the pain points and solving these very key challenges that everyone is talking about, which is the first one, to take the pain out of organizing, and the second one, to help fund activities. So moving on, uh, we just won a big award in London uh, a few weeks back, uh, the Sports Technology Award, where we were, um, you know, announced the most innovative sports app. So that was really awesome. Uh, we've had lots of positive feedback from the UK, which is, uh, you know, a very uh, interesting market for us. Um, Spawn is based in Oslo, Norway. We have about 900,000 now monthly active users. Um, and last year, 2 million events were created on the platform, and we support about 25,000 teams and groups. So so it's pretty fair to say that we've been adopted across the sector right now and we're really excited about that so um if you want to click so essentially last year we did um you know a, a thought piece or we did some research with our great partners uk coaching you saw emma earlier in street games and some of the guys over at sport england and essentially what we did is that we surveyed a bunch of coaches and we said look what are your pain points what we found when comparing you know the narratives in the uk with other markets is that the problems we tackle are pretty much universal just want to call out a few one out of four actually spent more than seven hours every single week on admin uh, purely you know excel spreadsheets and administrative off the pitch and about one out of three say that you know funding is a huge issue and this has actually led to more than half of coaches that we surveyed having considered quitting so the, the impact of that if that was the case is obviously huge so that's what we're trying to resolve so if you want to click again please uh respond then i think our biggest contribution to everyday lives and everyday sanity is that we save the average coach using spawn about two and a half hours every single week so this is just an example of how a typical event if you run a coaching session or something like that would appear on the app compared to you know that never-ending uh, whatsapp thread that you would have to serve on an individual uh play-by-play -play, uh move um if that was managed on whatsapp so if you want to click uh, so essentially then we exist to make organizing as easy as humanly possible and removing all the hurdles uh, so that, you know, our administrators and the coaches can spend more time on what we love. I am still to find a coach who loves Excel spreadsheet more than his or her sport. Uh, and what matters, which in our opinion, is to create happy and active communities. So it's essentially four dimensions of our product. We help you organize, communicate with your team or group, engage your members and drive revenue. Moving forward. Um, so just to tell you a little bit about how you get going and what our product actually does, it's really easy to get going. Um, onboarding is easy, you know, as long as you have your information in any type of structured format. So it's be an Excel spreadsheet or Google Sheet, something like that. You can simply copy and paste that into our member importer and it literally will just take you a few minutes to get going. Uh, next, please. So it allows you then to organize your members into subgroup. This is especially important if you manage big groups because it makes that you um, actually be able to kind of contact and target them and communicate with them directly, just the people that you're keen on speaking to or passing on a message. 
Uh, so we essentially have four key features, right? We have events, we have a post, so you can post pictures, files, anything. We have a polling. So if you want to do a survey, like what day is the best day to have a meeting, for example, or practice. And then we also allow you to do payments through our partners over at Stripe. Uh, so let's just talk through some of those. If you click again, please. Uh, it allows then parents to answer to any type of event on behalf of a child. So we serve kids groups, you know, mixed groups with kids and adults together, and then adult groups. So obviously kids group, you know, typically the kids don't have smartphones, so the, the parent is actually the one that's answering on their behalf. Uh, we're catered to the modern family. You can have, if you want to have three moms and three dads, that's totally cool. And it means that all parents can stay on top of their activity. It all syncs with your native calendar on your phone as well. So that's just really, you know, beneficial in the sense that you will not miss uh, an activity or an event again. So the, the benefit then, of course, from a coaching point of view is that you know exactly who is coming. This is particularly important these days where there might be, you know, caps on how many people can attend. So we have like waiting lists and max attendance. Uh, and it also means that from a track and trace perspective, you can always look at who was there for an event and you can export that file. So reminders are sent out automatically so you don't have to worry about that. And if you click again, you will then see, you know, this is what uh, attendance history file could typically look like. So using Spawn then, that gives you historically an overview of all your participation for any given event that you've hosted on the platform. So again, back to, for example, track and trace efforts or, you know, keeping track of who attended, uh, what days. And then you also have the association with a parent or guardian of that kid. So you can follow up with them very swiftly if you needed to do so. Moving forward, uh, Spond allows you to pretty much send private and group messages. You can share photos, you know, it's all private groups. You can share files, whatever information you need to get across. Uh, so it's kind of like if your calendar, Doodle, WhatsApp, and, uh, you know, whatever payment portal you use had a baby. Everything is mobile, obviously, and all the changes are real time. So you can push it across and everyone will get a push just like they would, you know, on a WhatsApp message or a text message. Uh, we also have a scene function, which is quite useful. So it actually confirms to you who has actually seen the message you've put across. Um, okay, next. So it allows you to collect payments also seamlessly. We're fully integrated with Stripe, um, which is a world leading payment provider. So that allows you to run any type of payments, which is obviously at this time too, very beneficial because you don't have to have cash in hand. You can just have a one click payment through the app for you know training fees or membership fees or, or, or any type of transactions. So I also want to call out when it comes to making sure that we are inclusive. So we get a lot of feedback that our UX, UI, and like our user experience is very easy. So that makes us very inclusive. There are no ads in the app. Our business model is transaction. So only when you make money, do we make money? And I just want to call out this too, because in any given group, when you talk about making a change to any kind of platform for technology, there's always someone who just would like to stick with email or regular paper or fax machines or Lord knows what. So if if you want to just not use an app, if you register using Spond and you've only signed up with your email without downloading the app, we will assume that you want your information via email. So while you know 98% of our user base essentially would use Spawn downloading the app, it's good to know that this is also an alternative for those who do not want to be um, using an app on a regular basis. So just to kind of sum it up, uh, what Spawn does is to help sports organizations deliver everything they need to deliver then the activity that they are organizing in the most efficient manner. So we are really, really excited about, you know, the partnership that we have with Active London. And we are really excited about all the support and, and usage that we're seeing in the UK. So, you know, if anyone wants to reach out or learn more about Spawn, my email is trine at spawn.com. So I think that pretty much sums it up. Um, one more click. It totally does. So again, thank you for this opportunity to talk to you a little bit about Spond. Uh, we serve again, everyone, uh, all sorts of sports and activities. And if you're a 65 or seven year old coach, or, uh, you are a 25 year old, like Spond works for everybody and every sort of any kind of activity. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. Great effort. So thank you very much, Trini. Um, now we're going to move to the last but not least, the last 10 minutes is going to be over to Good Boost. And Good Boost is an evidence-based product which is providing personalized 
physical activity and exercise programs um, within uh, pools, but also on land. And as with all three products, we've had the great privilege of working with uh, yeah, Good Boost Bond and, and Street Tag through the sport through the sport the cup across the the last few years. So, Ben, uh, over to you. Hello, can you hear me, Louise? You're good. Yeah, we could hear you. There we go. Trying to turn my camera on. Anyway, don't know what I can't. Not sure why my camera isn't going. Moderator, any idea why it's not working? Don't, don't worry, we'll deal with it. All right, You're okay. Good. Brilliant. In that case, let's just get going. Uh, so, hi everyone. I'm Ben. I'm the CEO of Good Boost. Uh, my background is in musculoskeletal research. I'm also an MSK clinical champion for Versa Arthritis. And what's really important is, next slide, the reason why we set up, essentially, it's the size of the problem of musculoskeletal health problems, not just in the UK, but globally. And it's not just this is a niggle in people's knee or a twinge in people's back. It's far much more than that. It's the primary cause of disability globally. It's the main reason for accidental mortality in over 65 because of a fall. One of the leading reasons for entering into a care home earlier than needed. Uh, 30,000 people die in the Europe and the US from opioid overdose from pain management medication almost 30 million working days lost because of sick leave and almost a five billion pound uh, cost to the NHS every single year. This is not a small problem. It's the third largest spend of the NHS budget. Uh, it's huge, not just in the UK, but globally. But if you next slide, please. We know that exercise works. It's really effective, both clinically and cost effective. It's an incredibly great intervention to manage treat and prevent musculoskeletal conditions. Next slide. But there are many barriers to land exercise. There's uh, poor adherence long term for people st sticking with exercise. Generally, as people get older, there's more inactivity uh, and there are a limited number of physiotherapies to deliver the services that are needed in the community. And with around 13% of the being international and Brexit looming, there's even more uncertainty of what the workforce can do to manage MSK in community settings. Next slide. What we know that there is, is a wealth of research that supports the uh, benefit of aquatic activity to manage, treat and prevent MSK conditions in the equivalent benefit for land exercise and rehab to improve pain, function and quality of life. Importantly, being in water overcomes the barriers of pain, long-term health conditions, fear, limited function by being in the water. People can move when they're in water in ways they can't move on land. Uh, and that was also supported by the report uh, last year by Swim England, highlighting the, the benefits of uh, swimming and aquatic activity for the health of the nation. Next slide. So we'll do a good boost. We create clinical artificial intelligence and we've been as a team of expert physios, researchers, clinicians, uh, AI specialists, uh, software engineers. We have distilled decades of research, uh, publication, clinical best knowledge into clinical algorithms that now work around artificial intelligence and machine learning to improve the suitability of exercises selected. And the way it works is new participants complete a digital assessment on the good boost app or online. That then goes through to uh, our GoodBoost server, which will then uh, calculate the most appropriate exercises for that individual and recommend it straight through to the app. The user will complete their exercises in the pool, provide feedback afterwards, was an exercise too easy, too difficult, actually it hurt in a certain position. Um, that feedback then goes back into our server to make sure that it's a continually evolving, adapting program week to week, just like having a personal therapist or a PT. Next. And this is what we've created, uh, individually tailored programs uh, that, are work, that can work with any size and depth of pools, including training pools, uh, that, that can be used as an individual, grabbing a tablet from reception and going in the pool by yourself, or to deliver group sessions as well. Um, and importantly, it creates measurable health impact from the data we gather and we keep collecting week by week, by week as people attend. Our AI has won multiple awards now. It makes it personalized. We have been co-designing what we do since we started with older adults and people living with MSK conditions. Co-design and co-production is a core part of our ethos and how we approach it. As I mentioned, it's individual and group sessions. And because we track that data, we provide pools of data dashboards so they can evidence the impact they're having in their local community. Next. Uh, we're 
unlike we're not just a piece of sport tech, we're a, we're a registered med medical device. Um, we are rated by Orca, the medical app reviewer, uh, Kite Mark, and we are one of the top rated physiotherapy apps on the planet uh, within the top 10% ever um, reviewed. Uh, we've been independently audited externally. We are part of Swim England's Water Wellbeing Programme, and we've come through Sport Tech Hub's uh, Accelerator. We've gone for a huge amount to make sure that what we deliver is incredibly high quality from, uh, from our infrastructure our operations, but importantly, our clinical technology too. Next. But there's more challenges working in water than just having the software itself, is we've had to overcome over the years many difficulties and have the right equipment to deliver it. When you're working with people with um, poor eyesight, uh, have um, uh, fingers and that have rheumatic di disorders, so that means that uh, gripping and grabbing things is difficult, you need to have the tablet was right to adapt to those user groups. And we now create our own tablet computers that are designed to be incredibly waterproof. They're one of the most waterproof in the market. Really quicky and easy clipping connect charging because when you've got 10 or 20 tablets to charge, having to individually clip out your waterproof bung to put the clip in, uh, it takes a couple of minutes per tablet. And that's a lot of time if you're doing that twice a day. Importantly, they float because a, the majority of waterproof tablets on the market will sink to the bottom of the pool. And you do not want to get your hair wet if you've come in for just a rehab session for your knee. Uh, they've got built-in rear stands and they've been designed to be impact resistant as well, so they can be used on land. Next slide. Uh, but beyond this, in response to COVID, we had to look at different ways of working. We were always moving towards land, uh, but it accelerated that process. And uh, we launched our land home app in uh, uh, August this year, which has had really positive feedback and really good impact to date. But it does also mean that what we've offered is, in addition to our aquatic program in leisure centers, there's land programs too, which can fit inside and alongside exercise referral programs for musculoskeletal conditions such as back pain and arthritis. So next slide. We work predominantly with people over 50, um, generally older than that, in their 60s and 70s. Generally, people are overweight, uh, obese. Um, and interestingly, for poor users, uh, a third of them are, are male for an aqua exercise session, whereas traditionally for aqua aerobics and similarly, they're usually a, a majority female audience. Really interestingly, is 41% of our users in the pool are even non-swimmers to low confidence swimmers. What we've been able to do is introduce ways and make it accessible for people who do not view themselves as traditional pool users to have a reason to come and use the pools. So it's creating a new membership and customer base. On average, they have two additional health conditions. A quarter of our users are from the lowest income houses in the UK, which is a key part of our social mission to cut through health inequalities. Two thirds register and inactive, and a third registered having their mobility of walking less than a metre, 100 metres, which means that these people would struggle to join a walking group. And that's why being in water and the way they can move in water is so beneficial to ensure they can be active. But that means we work with older adults, physically inactive, people who are obese, low income, multi mobility, and these individuals who have the greatest risk of being inactive, but also developing MSK conditions. Next slide. And as highlighted by uh, a study by UK Active, is that exercise has been voted one of the best ways to support people and help the NHS. And this isn't just during the pandemic. As you've heard in the news, elective surgeries are backlogged, appointments have been backlogged because of COVID. At, beyond this, from next spring, next year, the leisure center needs to become the bastion of health as well as leisure. Uh, and it's having products that can enable that and work and support these people that can be really important. Next slide. And so as I mentioned, we gather a lot of data. We need to demonstrate that we meaningfully improve people's function, pain, quality of life. And from an independent health economic evaluation, it's been highlighted that each pool we work with can create savings of £90,000 per pool and avoid a GP, uh, outpatients and hip and knee replacement surgeries. Next slide. And we get incredible positive feedback from people who stop taking their medication to people who are able to walk upstairs independently, people who can um, get up, have the motivation to get up in the morning and start riding their bike again. The impact we see is amazing. And the reason for that is exercise really works. What we've done is we found a way to make it accessible to a group of people who traditionally are not active. So the moment they become more active, the, the improvements are huge. 
And just to wrap up in the last bits that we do something which is affordable. Um, it's incredibly low cost compared to private personal training and physiotherapy. Uh, it means that people can attend a local pool compared to a hydro pool, which is a 20th to a 30th of the cost of that and less travel because it's a local pool rather than to travel long distances to a hydro pool or outpatient apartment. We're incredibly accessible. It's about creating local community access to musculoskeletal services. Um, that by being in water, it's lower impact for people, so it's accessible in that route. And it means it's accessible to non-traditional leisure centre members showing up and using that centre, which they normally wouldn't. From digital inclusion, because we have tablets available in community settings, it means that if people don't have a phone, they're able to access that technology in their local pool. As mentioned, we co-designed everyone, in, including our UI and UX. And by being in group sessions, you have that peer support for people who don't feel most comfortable or most tech savvy using technology. Next. And what it means for boosting the ledger sector, it means new members. It means hard to reach groups that are becoming members, non-swimmers becoming pool users, uh, and valuable services for social prescribing. It means we're gathering data, show real-time data of the health impact of venues and leisure centers. And it means new skills and services by upskilling existing teams so they can support people with MSK conditions uh, where they don't need to be a level four instructor because it's the clinical technology doing the decision making. And just to finish off, next slide. What's next is reach out if you're a pool, because we're always looking for new pools to work with. We're always looking for new partners and collaborators and joint funding bid around community health and well-being. And next. Thank you very much. We love to talk. I mean, put me a line at, at my good boost email. And thank you very much for your time today. Ben, many thanks for that. Really appreciate it. We I uh, appreciate it and aware that you, you were in a stage uh, fright, but uh, we, couldn't, we couldn't somewhat get it working. So hopefully we can when we bring you back on, on stage. But yeah, so for the next uh, last few minutes, um, we're going to bring the, there you are. There again, everyone. Um, for the, la the last few minutes, we're going to bring the, the panelists and the presenters back on stage. There are, um, yeah, quite a, quite a few questions that have been posted in the audience. So thanks for that um going to pick a handful and then therefore yeah just trying to have a conversation around those and uh, before we bring the session to a close so just waiting for my panelists to come back on on the virtual stage I'll start, Ben. I'll start with you, and and maybe start with Trini as well, considering that you're you're there. Um, there's a question around how do we ensure that sport tech doesn't reduce inequalities um, of access or of, of increasing physical activity. I think you both touched on around the co-designing element, but yeah, I, I, can, you know, what springs to mind as a as an answer to that? Um, maybe Ben, if I'll start with you, and then Trina, maybe you can jump in. Yeah, uh, the harsh reality is, 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 is there's going to become a barrier because of cost, uh, confidence and access. It, it, there is no doubt that exists, uh, as well as data, access to Wi-Fi. There are real challenges around this. Uh, the most important thing we can do is find ways to make sure there is a community of access to these technologies in the same way that we put tablet computers in swimming pools is to make sure if people don't have access to it uh, or couldn't afford uh, the technology it is available to them in a public setting um, as well as that on the design and ux um, we do a lot of focus groups and a lot of reviews with people with msk conditions arthritis back pain so many of the apps out there designed around self-management, self-help, rehabilitation are atrocious for accessibility features. Um, and it's critical that if people are going to start, if people are going to offer um, services, particularly to people who traditionally have more visual problems, more accessibility needs, uh, who are over 60, over 70, the design of the UX and the, uh, design of the US and the accessibility features need to be a core part of any team's focus. Thank you. And, and just to um, I suppose quickly elaborate in that when we're talking about UI and UX, we're talking about the user interface and the user interaction or the user experience um, within an app. So for anyone in the audience that, like me, at some stage had to had to research what UI and UX <laughs> means. Um, Trina, anything on that? No, I agree. I think like accessibility when it comes to design is really important, you know, like making sure that this is something that everyone feels they can use, that it's intuitive and it's like kind of welcoming. That's really important. 
I also want to just say that, you know, it's important that it is, I mean, we have, we are really into making sure that the app stays free. There's no ads or anything like that because we want to make sure that it's for everyone. And it, you know, it's also making sure that it's meaningful, this purpose that it serves. And one of the reasons why now we are putting more of our efforts from a development point of view into launching, you know, uh, capabilities such as fundraising capabilities is because we also want to make sure that everyone can participate, uh, you know, to reduce potentially training fees, membership fees, and also to make sure that sports and grassroots sports is sustainable is something that we're really passionate about. Um, so I think, uh, you know, that's essentially, it's a combination of lots of factors. Uh, but um, I think that, you know, the, the biggest thing right now is that it's available for anyone. It's easy to understand and that it solves some of the bigger problems that or challenges that we have in society. Thank you. Um, there's a question here from uh, DW. Uh, so thanks for that. But uh, I think uh, then thinking more or trying to come in a little bit more, Suzanne, Emma, Emma, Christina, um, the, the question is around the importance of leaders within public sector organization, within our industry, of sort of talking around the use of technology. Um, and I suppose the, the side question to that is, can it be done effectively without input from people at the top? So I think this is, a, you know, I suppose a, a, an audience member that is probably caught in an organization maybe are hopefully inspired or enthused or thinking off but yeah i suppose that maybe the reservation then is around success success pre success or do we need to have more people within the sector talking around um, technology and and yeah and could a could a you know could a person from within be talking around without the need to maybe get endorsement from above i'm i'm happy to kick off with that one alex it's please do and suzanne you were about to join in so I'll, I'll line you a second if it's all right you have to have both and you have to have buy-in from the very, very top. So if you have a board, it needs to be from your board uh, because it, ha it has to be part of a overarching strategy, which I think Suzanne spoke about earlier. So it has to come from right from the top and, and all the way through the organization it has to have buy-in. I think that the kind of bit that as a sector, a sports and physical activity sector, that's really under the pump at the moment, um, we need to talk more. Um, and because there's a lot of rep, a lot of duplication going on, um, and there's limited resources in the space, so I think that you know we've seen three great examples of of, of tech providers, um, and I think we need to kind of make sure that we're not all just kind of flying off, reinventing the wheel. <laughs> Thank you, Suzanne. Yeah, I was going to say it absolutely. It you can't, especially if you work for an organisation like mine, you can't as as a single centre go rogue. And, and start trying to implement this yourself. You have to have board buy-in and it won't go anywhere without it. But if, if you are struggling to get board buy-in, the one suggestion that I would have for you is understand what is the culture within your organization? What are the things that they value? Because once you can understand those elements of it, then start focusing on what will the digital side of it do to move the, the culture, to, to amalgamate the two together. And I think, I think we are at a tipping point because a lot of, and it, it isn't, I, I've got friends who own boutique studios and I've got friends who manage um, budget gym type settings as well as leisure center. We all had to change our business. So I think that fitness is at this tipping edge where there is this acknowledgement where before COVID, it was kind of happening in the background. And at times we even saw it as a competitor rather than something that needed to be integrated with our business. COVID tipped us over that edge. We now understand that technology needs to be integrated. And when you start looking at all the latest reports coming out of Mintel, they're saying the same thing. So I think bringing those senior leaders on that education path with you and telling them how these two can work together to offer a better product for your customers with more diversification. Thank you. Um Ali and Emma, uh, I'm gonna come come in with you, uh, come in, yeah, with this question, and then Christina, I've got one line up around maybe um, with a view of a, of an out of industry, maybe sharing of knowledge and bringing it into our industry. But first, Emma, Emma and Ali, there's a question here around how do we help the sport and physical activity sector become more tech savvy 
or embrace tech solutions and i think we very briefly discussed this earlier but yeah what, what could we be doing better to help whether you're a grassroots club community organization and activity provider or whether you're a you know larger uh, maybe a national governing body of sports so what can the sector be doing to educate others within I mean, we've done some work, sort of obviously with our like with our local sort of sports providers, and because obviously they were in the same boat as us of not being able to sort of provide sort of face to face stuff. So, but they didn't have the knowledge. So actually, it's sort of we're helping them sort of if there are other sort of platforms out there, or if it's just well, we've got people within the council that we can put you in touch with that can sort of give you some guidelines of how to set up and you know or other community organisations that are sort of around locally that have got that. Sort of got some people that have got that sort of little bit of knowledge to set up your own website or even sort of even simple things like facebook groups and instagram um, sort of, um platforms as well so it's sort of, sort of getting people to talk together and, and i suppose that's sort of come quite a lot of, sort of across the whole of this sort of period of time is actually there's you know different community groups that wouldn't normally have sort of come together and sort of communicated with each other have actually not been forced to but actually they can see the the skills and um, benefits that you know each organisation can bring, and actually working together, they've been able to sort of increase the the offers that are, are out there for everybody. Right, and I'll, I'll just add to that: if you're if you're looking to reach out to smaller community groups, smaller sports clubs, smaller activity clubs, um, don't forget about the partnerships with the bigger organisation associated with that particular sport or activity, because if you can partner with them, that then brings the credibility for you as a startup business as you start making your introductions to uh, the local groups. Thank you very much, Ali and, and Emma. Christina, this is this is um, a question around the, the, the versatility, I suppose, of uh, in, in, in the question we're talking about sport tech, but I'm keen, I'm keen for you to maybe you know, just share the move being use case with how it started and where it's where it's now going and I suppose that versatility of going into other sectors and other industries. So yeah, it's around that versatility, helping organization achieve outcome and I suppose um but maybe an outcome that goes or 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 starting with an outcome and then potentially growing to others once there is an understanding of what the product can do or is doing. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, I would say, first of all, like we we've been at this for five years, you know, and we're constantly learning. And, you know, I sort of smile sometimes when people say start up or, you know, I think you're always starting up. You get to different stages in your company. You know, I created Moodbeam out of a very personal need because I wanted to keep connected to my my young daughter at the time. But the emphasis and the impetus is there no matter who you're dealing with, whether it's a community or you know, a skill group or a working group or whatever it is, you've got to have that level of understanding that means that you can, you can get to the next stage each time. So that's what we began with. We began with something that would hopefully allow somebody to you know, diarise their daily moods, how they felt about something. And we spent you know, the first couple of years really sort of researching that area. And it's naturally the conversations that we started to have within education, within health and social care, within workplace well-being. But I think every single conversation we have ever had, and it goes back to Emma, is is why why do you think this is going to improve your life or um, act as a mechanism for greater understanding? And I think um, because it has actually been designed with people in mind, uh, uh, with purpose, I guess, as well, but also the fact that it's got to allow you to find out something that you didn't already know. I think the biggest barrier and maybe something that can be a transferable learning from industries, you know, to the sports industry is that um, really ask the right question. Going back to that thing again, this we're a tool. Luckily, we're a tool that provides the whole sort of, you know, mood uh, metric if you like to to whatever the question is going to be but i think fundamentally the biggest learning has got to be being able to pinpoint why something needs to change why it's been a problem before and how we've evolved as a as a company and as a brand if you like and and we like to think we've taken a long time doing this is because we have the integrity behind what we're trying to do we've always got the people and we used to ha have the conversations about, do you think this is going to be of any use? And then we had these conversations about, OK, that's great, uh, brilliant for education. But you know what? And this maybe is um, 
uh, right across the board. If you've got under-resourced, overstretched people who are experts and know an awful lot, the last thing they want is more work. So what we've sort of tried to do is use our, our simple technology to take away that pain to actually, you know, now we're sort of uh, pivoting again sort of because of COVID. We were already having conversations within workplace well-being. Now it's very much within employee engagement and community engagement, uh, having that sort of real-time approach around waiting, you know, to the end of the month and going, why did that happen? You find out straight away. And I think uh, implementing that mentality um, it is really, really important because you want to have an early intervention mechanism. You want to have a way of actually communicating with people no matter where they are. And this is where sort of our tech has really helped working families. And I can't see why it wouldn't work within the sporting communities as well, because it's really been able to identify early on what somebody's struggle is. And it's not always an internal struggle. It can be an external struggle, but being able to sort of uh, pinpoint okay, that makes sense, um, and actually have the buy-in from the people, sort of, you know, employees on the ground floor, but also managers who think, ah, this is actually not going to create any more work for me, so I will take it to the board and let the board decide. But equally, some conversations that we're having at the moment is that the boards, uh, the directors are already in on this conversation. They know that the only way really to, you know, whether it's a, a return on investment for them or, you know, the very fact that they are, they can see really good people who have worked their way up the, the you know, the organisation to suddenly leave or, God forbid, something worse happen. Why didn't we do more about that? And if you actually put the why didn't we do more about that into the hands of the people, then it takes away the accountability. It takes away the fact that, you know, you're not finger pointing at HR saying, why didn't we know about this? If you can get that conversation and mechanism in place from the get go, from the minute that somebody joins this community or circles, as we call them, Moodbeam circles are circles that bounce off each other and are people, whether it's in their working life or their sporting life or their hobbies or whatever it is, it makes that person. And I think the most important thing that our technology is evolving to hopefully support people in is the fact that um, it's the people first, not the technology. It's got to be all about the people and the people will soon tell you if it's no good for them. And you've got to listen, you've got to listen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I was given a, uh, a, a useful nudge from, from my colleague around timing. So um, I appreciate that we, we rattle through pretty much that session without any break, um, just breaking the look and feel, but maybe not an actual break for the audience member. So um, I think what's left to say is just once again, a huge, huge, huge thank you to all of you for giving um, an hour and a half, almost two hours of your time um, today. Uh, I, yeah, I thoroughly enjoyed it. My, my nervousness on hosting it quickly went away once the conversation got going. And that's thanks to you for, for being so open um, in, 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 in your answers and, and sharing what you did. Um, thanks, Ben, um, Trina, Sean, who um, is, is in the audience and kind of, kind of, kind of didn't quite come in into the, the virtual stage as such for also then talking us through your products. Um, and then for the audience member, I suppose, if you are now thinking, what next? Um, I'll encourage you to to use the most of Sport Tech Hub being an initiative that is is funded, created by London Sports uh, and very much a an innovation network there that have access to startups or small, medium enterprises, tech products that are aligned to tackling an activity, getting more people active and making sure that people are benefiting from the from being physically active from a physical and mental well-being or community point of view so if you're quite unsure what is out there what products could i use you know i would welcome you to come and challenge us come and post that question to us let us help you um and if we don't have it within our network we can we can for sure go and source it or scout it through our global network or the the the, the relationships that we have with other innovation programs um from across the world so once again thanks for um people in the audience and thanks to all of you for being a, a great panelist and speaker. So have a great rest of the day, a great Friday and a weekend. Um, yeah, thank you.